Welcome to Pastoring God's Sheep. I am your host, Pastor Timothy. I come to you not to be politically correct or to sugarcoat God's Word, but to bring you help and support in your life and understanding what God's Word is saying. I will do this by bringing God's Word in God's truth, not what man might want to hear, but what, as Christians, God wants us to hear. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration, with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. This afternoon, my guest is Pastor John Claude. I appreciate you coming on and joining me today. Thank you. It's my privilege to be here. Our topic today is God can cross up the devil's setup. This is based on Genesis chapter 48 verses 1 through 20. And in order to save time, I'm not going to read them. So those of you that have the opportunity to open your Bibles and read that scripture, please, I urge you to do so. In this story, Jacob was blind. And when it came time to lay his right hand on the older son, as tradition would have it, Jacob did something strange. After the boys were positioned with the youngest on Jacob's right and the oldest on his left, surprisingly, he crossed his hands and laid the right hand of greater blessing upon the younger son and the left hand of lesser blessing upon the older son. Why is this important? Incredibly important because in his ways, God foreknows the history, how it is going to develop in the future. And in his ways, God will always have the final authority on anything that happens. The reason, I believe, the reason God had Jacob cross his hands, because it was not just Jacob's idea, obviously. Obviously. Yeah. Um, and he puts his hands over Manasseh and Ephraim. God foreknew beforehand that the whole nation eventually would be divided into two north and southern kingdom. You remember that? Right. And so the, <clears throat> the foreknowledge of God, in his foreknowledge, what he does, he operates through the life of individuals so that in the future, those, the descendants of these, in, uh, of these individuals will fulfill his purpose. It is so, it's such an interesting concept, such an interesting uh, strategy that God did there. Because when Solomon sent, he actually fulfilled the prophecy uh, in, in a certain way. Because God foreknew Solomon's sin, no question about that. Right. After he sinned, is when God divided the northern and the southern kingdom. The very first king of the northern kingdom was an Ephraimite, a descendant of Ephraim, the one who had received the greater blessing. And 
That is significant because of his future for the descendants of Ephraim. He knew they were going to be taken into captivity. The last, cap the last uh, was 732 BC, when uh, all of Israel was carried out into the nations, first around Syria and all these regions, but then throughout the world. But that's an interesting prophecy because at that time, when Jacob crossed his hands and Joseph came up and said, no, 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 father. And <laughs> in a certain sort of a way, Jacob said, you know, I, I know what I'm doing, just let me do it, kind of a thing. He didn't say that, right. but, <laughs> but he says, he will become a great nation. And that is so interesting because Ephraim has been scattered throughout the whole world, and only God knows the descendants that are today in the world that are mixed descendants of Ephraim, because Ephraim became the nickname for the Northern Kingdom. Correct? Correct. That's correct. And he said, my firstborn, Ephraim is my firstborn, when in fact, Reuben was the firstborn, the first son of Jacob was Reuben. So technically, Reuben is the firstborn, but because of his sin of committing adultery with his stepmother, he lost the blessing. And Ephraim was given the blessing that was supposed to go to Reuben. And Ephraim became a multitude of nations throughout the world to this day. And um, when Yeshua, when Jesus said, I have other sheep not of this fold, he was referring, of course, the fold of Judah and Benjamin that were right, here, right. as well as uh, Levi, the tribe of Levi, who was the, the priestly tribe. So these three were mainly in, in Judah. But all the other tribes that had been scattered were the first one to hear the gospel. You see, during the Feast of the Lord, in which all people came for Passover, or for uh, Pentecost, and for the Feast of Tabernacles, three times a year they were commissioned to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. And they came from all over the place. You remember in the Book of Acts, right. it says Cappadocia and Smyrna and all these nations that it were, they spoke, they even spoke different languages. Remember? Right. That's right. They spoke different languages and the Holy Spirit came on and suddenly they hear each other speak in their own language. So there was a fulfillment of what God had intended to do with Ephraim and Manasseh in crossing the hands over. But there's more to it than that. So, uh, according to Genesis, nobody can take what God says is yours. Many of us, including myself, have accepted in their lives what somebody else has said about them. The fact that you're no good, you'll never amount to anything. How John Claude does God change that in people? He does it through His Holy Spirit that He placed inside of us as believers. And it's through maturity in the spiritual life that we now overcome the flesh. Because the flesh and the spirit are at enmity with one another. The, f the flesh is our natural tendency to respond it is unnatural to respond in the spirit. Except as we mature more and more in the Lord, you see. And the first foundational truth that we really need to recognize is that the believer has two nature, two natures. Tim has two natures, Jean-Claude has two natures. One a sinful nature and a spiritual nature, right. the born again right. nature. So, and people get confused sometimes. Well, they say there's two of me. No, there's not two. There's one Tim, 
there's one Jean-Claude, but has two nature. And somebody used an illustration that was really good years ago, I heard. It was this fellow who um, is sitting on the sidewalk, and he's got his head in his hands, and, and, he, and he pinches his head one side the other, one side and the other, and, and somebody passes by and says, what are you doing? And the fellow said, well, I have this fight in my head, in my brain. It's like a white dog fighting a black dog, and a black dog fighting a white dog, and it just goes on. And the fellow stops and he says, well, which one wins? And the answer was, the one I feed the most. Good, good answer. You see, and so the question that, that we need to raise is, what goes inside of our mind the most? Because whatever we put in there is what's going to come out. And so the more we play scriptures and we depend on the word of God, the more is what is going to build and nourish that new nature. And if we, we strive to make the old nature better, it doesn't work. A lot of believers I fall into that trap. That. Yeah, a lot of believers fall into that trap, making that old nature. God has nothing to say to the old nature. It is died, it died with Christ. Romans 6 says it very clearly. My old man was crucified with Christ when I came to him. My old man was buried, died with Christ. My old man was buried with Christ. Crucified was Christ, dead was Christ, buried was Christ. At salvation, God places my old nature right there with him. He identifies me with the death, burial, uh, the death, crucifixion, the crucifixion, the death and the burial of Christ, my old nature. But when Christ rises from the dead, guess what? So do we. So do we. In Ephesians chapter 1, Christ raised us up with him and sat us with him in the heavenly places so that now we are one with him and he is our life. So operating in that new nature is what God wants. And it's only as we feed that on that nature, which is of course the word of God and communion with the Lord, that we now are going to be able to overcome this fleshly nature Amen. with which Amen. we fight all the time. Now, with the uh, comments that you made as far as being raised with Christ and everything, that brings me to a deal concerning baptism uh -huh. where I have heard people say, as a matter of fact, a Lutheran pastor made the comment at my dad's funeral that my dad was saved through baptism. Well, that's a lie from Satan. You're not saved through baptism. Baptism simply shows your, outwardly shows your inward belief, your inward faith that God has changed your life when you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you go under that water in baptism, it's showing your sinful life being washed away. That washing comes through the blood of Christ. When you come up out of that water, it's symbolizing your rising with Christ and having that Christian life, that Christian walk that is you're going to have for the rest of your life. You're not a mature Christian at this point. You're a mature Christian, in all honesty, John Claude. What is that? It's a very good question, brother. Uh, a mature Christ Christian, think about this. Think about a child who is born. He is perfectly equipped, formed, and all. Everything is fine. He grows up, and things are going to change, of course, in his body and his butt. Every stage of growth is part of his maturity, you see. So there is, there is a, um, an inherent maturity in terms of, 
of growth in the Lord, which will depend, it will depend upon our willingness to submit and surrender and abide in him. And you could say that uh, a Christian is mature to the extent that he is abiding in Christ, he is conformed to the will and the ways of God. If a Christian simply considered himself a Christian on Sunday morning or on Wednesday evening uh, and pays no attention to the spiritual life during the rest of the week, that man is never going to really be mature. Amen. Because I've seen, I've actually met people that say they've been Christians for 14, 20, 50 years, and yet they're still on the milk of the word, not on the meat. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 there's so many c contexts to that, of course, because we do not know the past of these people. You know, there are, there are many varied backgrounds to everyone and hindrances in this background and until until a person really discovers the depth of the love of God for them that it is a love that is that we are accepted in the beloved according to the scriptures apart from anything that I can do God accepts me in Christ that is his ground for accepting me apart from anything that I'm going to do Amen. And so Amen. that is by faith we have to accept that. And if we do not recognize that, then we're going to struggle to try to be approved of Him. Okay. So would you agree that to a great extent that a lot of this has to do with people's failure to get into the scriptures yeah. and to be in prayer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so the and and the, and I think probably one of the big reasons for that is because the lack of discipleship. And now, when I say discipleship, I'm talking about the discipleship that was uh, expressed the way Jesus did it. Yes. Remember, yes. he had he had seventy that he sent out, and he had twelve. But among those twelve, he had three that he spent more time with. Peter, James, and John. Right. And so he invested himself in those three. And they were called pillars, these three, in the book of Colossians. They were pillars in the church. So we have a pattern there, which Paul also picked up with Timothy and Silas and Barnabas, you see. And so he invested himself in those people. And I am positive that these people invested themselves in, in other people, in three, two or three, or whatever you can handle. But that issue that you're bringing up, brother, I think is, is one of the most devastating issue in the church. We are not doing discipling according to the scriptures. We do a class on Sunday morning, we call that discipleship because we're teaching scriptures. No, no, no the investment of our part on the part of somebody in us and of us in someone is where the dynamic that is necessary of, for a new believer will take place. Because it's lacking otherwise. The, the church is not operating the way it was supposed to operate according to the scriptures. And that's a huge subject to discuss. It's, it's really sad. Amen. And maybe you and I can discuss that at a later at a later date, on uh, when we have more time on a sh on a program. I think that would be a great topic for oh. you and I to do at a later date. Yeah, definitely. It's it's uh, those are topics that are left aside, and part of the part of the problem has been that instead of uh, meeting in, in small groups in homes, that's where the church in the house of yes, right. Yes. The platform for that is the best because there can be interaction among the believers. Whereby in a traditional setting in a church, you can't stop the pastor and say, excuse me, pastor, can you repeat what you just said? Or I don't agree with what you just said. Or you know, what you said is right, but I need more explanation. It can't happen in a traditional church setting. This but in the home, yes. 
this is true, or at least in people's minds, their human minds, their earthly minds, they don't think they can do this. And sadly, a lot of pastors would frown on it. But if you have questions, if you need something made more clear that your pastor has said in church or one of us says here on the air, feel free to call the number that's on your on the screen right now and ask whatever questions and I'll be more than happy to try and respond to them for you. I, if I can't get ha if I don't have the answer immediately when you call, I will get the answer and I will call you back. But you will get the answer. You will get the growth that you're asking for. Mm -hmm. it, I like to compare discipleship to coaching. You know, when we think of discipleship, it's much more a theological type of a term. Or, or another word would be mentoring. Mentoring, yeah, mentoring. Um, a, a coach in a, in a football or in basketball, whatever, coaching uh, sport, he takes particular attention to individuals, you see. And there will always be some individuals that that particular coach will be more attracted to because he sees a potential that he can and then some others will need different attention you see and discipleship is really like this you know it's a mentorship the mentor there is a mentoring in coaching yes absolutely that, there that's was a time when i was younger that i actually helped coach swim team there you go which was one of the most enjoyable things that i'd ever done because I was actually out there helping people learn something and make help make them better at what they were trying to do. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do as believers. Yes. You see, but we have institutionalized what God had meant to be a family. And it has lost the power that God intended for the church to have. You see? Amen. So we need, there needs to, there is a, a, a definite need of restoration of that kind of interaction among believers, you see. And so, that, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that is, it's a personal issue for every single believer. Lord, who do you have for me that I can mentor, coach? Is there someone around me that you want me to minister to? Is there someone around me that you want to minister to me with? Amen. You see, because Amen. it goes both ways. Nobody yes. is perfect. Right. Nobody is mature. All, <laughs> we all need to be mentored at one time or another. Absolutely. Concerning one aspect or another of our life or, or our understanding of what Christ wants us to know. Absolutely, yeah. You see, and so when, when you begin when we began this with this topic and use use the um, Joseph the sons of Joseph Ephraim and Manasseh and Jacob crossing his hands over you see the wisdom of God already knew the kind of life one was going to live right so be, suddenly Joseph has to mentor coach Ephraim more than he did Manasseh Yes, absolutely. You see? And and so it's really, really interesting to understand these 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 Amen. concepts. Amen. Now, many of us are going are we're not going to become, we're not going to do in our lives what people are expecting us to do. Just because you might not be good in let's say math they think you won't become a mathematician or be able to help people in mathematics. God can cross his hands over and change that. God can give you what you need to help other people. And this is the big, big, big thing that I want people to understand. 
out of this program today today is God can and will cross his hands over and change those things that Satan meant to hurt you. Satan meant to stop the life that God has for you to do. The way you can have God cross his hands over and change that is through being scriptures daily not once a week not once a month but daily and stay in prayer now what is prayer prayer is simply having conversation with your father in heaven as you would have with a friend as you would have with your dad here on earth do that with God each and every day now the thing we have just a couple of minutes left here so John Claude do you have anything that you feel that somebody out there is needing at this moment simply and that's true for any for everybody it's it's a truth that must be anchored in our souls and minds there is a finish work a finished work that God has done in the life of every single individual. He has set them with him in the heavenly places. There is no striving to become more and more like Christ. It is to look to him, abide in him, rest in his word, and believe the word for what it says. Because without faith, you mentioned it earlier, it's impossible to please yes, God. Absolutely. And so, in, the, in that sense, the, the subject that was uh, in conversation today, the struggle that is within the hearts of individuals who want to please God, it begins with understanding the finished work of Christ at the cross, our identification with Him in all aspects of life. And that, that's a subject we could spend hours on because so many scriptures refer to that. God wants us to know we belong to Him forever, Amen. the moment we Amen. come to Him. And that in and of itself settles an issue of acceptance on His part. I'm not accepted by Him because of what I do. I'm accepted of Him because of what He has done through Christ. We are accepted in the Beloved, a part of anything that I can do myself. It is such a liberating truth. Amen. If the sun sets Amen. you free, you, you will be free, free indeed. indeed. Amen. And in closing, we just want to remind each and every one of you, attend church every week. Find a church that is going to teach you God's Word. Not what man wants you to hear, but what God wants you to hear. I know those churches are in your area. You just need to seek out the right one. And I ask you to do so. And please, stay in your scripture daily and stay in prayer with your Father in heaven each and every day. Thank you and God bless each and every one of you.